Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to The Racial State. I'm, it's an honor and a privilege today to be joined by Two Black, who is a poet, a podcaster, an organizer, and an author who is based in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the United States. And he's agreed very kindly to talk to me today about a ca campaign that he's involved in to free the Pendleton II, which he'll be talking about in a little while. And he's also made a documentary on this case. So just to begin, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, just to get things rolling? Uh, yeah, so go by the name Two Black that started as being a performance artist, as a spoken word poet. poet. Um, so as that, I always try to, the things we're going to be talking about, I always try to incorporate that into my poetry. But, you know, as I've gotten older, I realized that poetry is great, but it's not going to necessarily move people to do anything in and of itself. Uh, so you have to get, get, get to get your hands a little more dirty. So you know, I've ventured in organizing and, um, you know, podcasting to try to get the message out in other ways um, and, uh, and filmmaking as well um, in this case. Um, so that's a little bit of my background without going into a long story. So. Yeah, you certainly got a lot of strings to your bow. And as an avid listener of your uh, podcast, the Black Myths podcast, I highly recommend uh, Two Blacks Work. It's really, really, I mean, it's taught me so much. And that's where Thank I you. learned about the campaign to free the Pendleton Two. So could you tell us a little bit about the Pendleton Two themselves and a little bit about why you decided to make a film about them? Mm -hmm. uh, so the Pendleton Two is uh, Christopher Naeem Trotter and um, John Balagun Cole. They are political prisoners um, here in the United States in Indiana. Um, there was an uprising in um, 1985 that was sparked by the uh, beating of a um, another prisoner inside the uh, Pendleton Correctional Facility um, by the name of uh, Lincoln Love, a.k.a. Lokmar. He was being beat up by the prison guards, who we find out later were a part of a white supremacist guard gang called the Sons of Light. Um, and not in a generic white supremacist guard gang, but they were a KKK or Ku Klux Klan right. splinter group, um, to, to be more specific. So he was being being beat up on this day. It was uh, February 1st, 1985. Mm -hmm. And um, they had rushed, they had searched the cells. They were in what was called the maximum security unit. That is the, what people who may only know about prison through maybe films or something, what folks would call the hole or solitary mm -hmm. confinement or yeah. something of that nature. Um, and he was, so, so Lincoln Love was in this unit. The guards had searched the units multiple times. It didn't really, no one really understood why. And then they eventually targeted this unit. He was, um, so several guards took billy clubs, they tear gassed the cell, they handcuffed him, and then they mm -hmm. brutally beat him to the point where the witnesses who were, who, who could see this from across the other cell yeah. thought that, uh, or the cell across from him thought yeah. that, you know, he was, he was dead, you know, wow. so, uh, <clears throat> so he was dragged out and then they shouted to population. That's where, there's less lockdown again for people who may not know a lot about prisons. Yeah. So they shout outside of their unit to where some mm -hmm. of the other prisoners are and they get word down to um, the, who we're talking about the penalties and two, they eventually along with other prisoners come to see what's going on because their understanding was that he was, he was either dead or he was about to die. Um, mm -hmm. That was their understanding. Yeah. Wow. So they went to the, the, to the um, captain's office looking for him. Um, the, you know, again, this is John Balagun Cole and Christopher Naim Trotter. Um, they couldn't, the, they asked initially, they asked peacefully, then they were attacked by the guards. You know, you let the guards tell it. I was actually just looking through their version of the story. They never even threw a punch. <laughs> the right, guards, course, if you let the guards tell it, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but so, you know, they're attacked by the guards. First, they, I think they said they were tear gas. They're trying to push to see because they want to know where he's at. Cause there's this curtain that was pulled. And usually when this curtain was pulled in this particular office, that symbolizes someone was being beaten up. This yeah. was regularly known mm -hmm. um, throughout the prison. Um, they couldn't find him. So after they pushed through this initial point of guards who attacked them, they're going to, well, going to the uh, infirmary, infirmary looking for Lincoln Love. Uh, A.K.A. Lokmar. And then at this point, this is when all these guards swarm. They're on the radio, you know, swarming to attack them, like the prison is being taken over, et cetera, et cetera. So then they're forced to the Pendleton and two and the, and the and the and the prisoners that they're leading are forced to fight off all these other guards that are taking them mm. 
And, you know, long story short, they um, they took a few people hostages. I hate to use movie references, but I know this is what people identify with. Yeah. So yeah. if you're being chased and you can imagine being chased by a bunch of guards and there's a cell house that you're trying to get into because you can seek refuge in there. You take a few hostages so some of your people can sneak in. And then that that kind of keeps the guards at bay. Sure. They take the hostages they, and then they lock themselves in this cell house of Jay for about 15 hours. So then they call the media, the black media specifically, to get um to get to get help because they say, look, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't come, they're gonna kill us, right? So sure. they call them. The um, the black the eventually they that was a new that was a radio station. Eventually the newspapers, the black newspaper of Indianapolis, the Indianapolis recorder, and the general newspaper of uh, the white newspaper of the city indianapolis star sends since witnesses the national guard is called in mm -hmm. um but the prisoners come together <clears throat> and they form um about 14 different demands um mm -hmm. some of those were about uh you know better more erect time because a lot of times they're just on lockdown so just having more time outside of their cells mm -hmm. uh you know better pay because they're working jobs in prison um, you know, at the time there weren't any black guards, so mm. uh, they wanted to have more black guards. Um, there was food issues; they weren't they weren't able to really practice their religion and eat different kinds of foods. They were being yeah. forced to eat pork. So they were being forced to eat pork every day. That was part of the thing. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it was about fourteen different demands. They used that to negotiate the release of the hostages and have these demands met. And then there was they were told there would be no retaliation, which you know, the West will get to. That's not how it went down. So um, they are walked back to their cells. I learned later. I didn't even know this. Um, it really, I don't even think. I think I learned this after we finished the film that one of the journalists actually walks back with them to their cells, mm -hmm. uh, just to make sure nothing happened on the way there. Mm -hmm. um, so they go back to their cells, but then they're thrown in the hole. And then the trial, which happens about two years later. So imagine they're already in the hole the whole time from 85 to 87. Um, so it's a little under two years, a little under three years, I should say. Uh, from, from, and they're in the hole the whole time, just waiting to go to trial because they were kept in what was called segregation away from everyone else. Yeah. Um, so they, they're getting shipped in different prisons even after that. And then they go to trial. It's an all white jury. Um, mm -hmm. it's in a county that I believe at the time was forty percent black, so wow. it's an all white jury. The the according to <clears throat> according to Naeem, one of the Pendleton two, he, you know, he said that um some of the jurors even knew some of the people who worked in this prison. Um, and and they were a lot of them were from a city that was known to be a a clan hub, Elwood, wow. Indiana, um, within Madison County. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> as you can probably imagine, for those listening. This trial didn't go well, but even when the evidence, because obviously their defense was self-defense, um, <clears throat> but they were never allowed to present any of the evidence. They, the it was deemed basically irrelevant to the mm. to the to the case. So their state of mind, why they had the state of mind, the conditions of the prison was all objected to by the prosecution, and it was upheld by the judge. Often, mm. when things were said that would have maybe been on the side of them the jury was dismissed. Right. Um, like this sounds so bad. It almost sounds like I'm making it up, but that's, that's what went down. And mm -hmm. then, you know, ultimately they received, um, uh, Christopher Naim Trotter receives 142 years. Um, and John Balogun Cole receives 84 years for what was effectively just saving a man's life. And, and on that day, Lincoln Love, AKA Logmar did not die. Nice. Um, you know, so that, that, that that did mean something because honestly he probably would have but the the guards who were beating him had to go chase the had to go chase these brothers um and then so once they're convicted they're moved around different prisons because they're seen as problems because of their ability to organize and sure. influence the population um they eventually get sent out to these supermax prisons mm -hmm. which was supposed to be built for the supposedly most violent prisoners um and that's solitary confinement as well in total um they spent um naeem who got 142 years spent 20 years of solitary confinement and um Balogun, john balagun cole who um got the 84 years spent 32 years solitary confinement 
So um, neither one of them have been out that long um, mm -hmm. and they're still in prison right now. So our goal is to our goal is in the defense committee, <clears throat> which I'm a part of, yeah. is obviously to 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 free them. So, you know, one of the things we did to free them or to help free them is to, you know, make a documentary so people could mm -hmm. hear them tell the story, not just me in interviews or someone yeah. else um, like my co-director. I mean, that's fine, but you can hear the film is very focused on them telling the story, you know. Yeah, and right from the beginning, I mean, you've done interviews with them from inside where they've spoken in their own voices that I've that I've listened to. And I think that's what comes across so strongly in the documentary is the centering of their own voices, not just as sort of testifying about something that, you know, you are telling the story or others are telling the story, but really that they mm -hmm. are directing this. And what comes mm -hmm. across very clearly also is the role of politics in all of this. So, you know, what was interesting in the way you told it, that firstly, they were trying to, the, the main thing is that they are trying to save a man's life. The second thing is that they were organizing with other prisoners to um, mm -hmm. meet certain demands that they had. So that that means that there was already a community of practice, of, po of you know, political practice within the within the prison, which I think a lot of people who are unconnected to prisons or who don't read or think about them very much beyond, you know, television or, or movies right, don't really right. don't really know goes on. So 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 the other question I have, you know, one thing that came across in the film was very much the men's commitment to each other, um, mm. as I'm saying, out of this practice. And uh, Lincoln Love or Lockmar was described in the film as being like a professor. Um, he was involved in teaching others, and I believe he was a jailhouse lawyer also, and he worked mm -hmm. to get young people released. So so can you talk a little bit more about this role of care, which is ever present in the movie? Yeah, I mean, honestly, the film barely touches the surface of how much mm. they were doing. I, I'm I'm learning more even as I go. I'm I'll, I'll mm. trying to get a project funded to hopefully, you know, speak more to the broader um, apparatus. But um, yeah, there was in the film, we talk about um, the, I almost said the Sons of Light. We talk about uh, the Black Dragons, mm. um, who, who was a, a group that the state tried to present as this, you know, kind of black hate group or something that was involved in extortions and all of this stuff. Mm. And it's not to say that this group was perfect, but, you know, the group was also, you know, I'll say also, but this group was more so involved in, um, in uh, mutual aid and care packages where if you came into prison, because a lot of them knew each other prior to prison. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Mm. Unfortunately, a lot of people grow up in this, you know, mm. so this becomes the world that they know. So, so they may know each other from the streets or whatever. When you come into prison, you don't, and it's, this is stated in the film, if you don't have, you know, a toothbrush, you don't have just basic yeah. needs, which are not easy to obtain in prison. Like you got to pay for all those things. That's why you work. Which often. is amazing. I think to right. people from outside, they don't, can't imagine that you would have to pay for basic necessities. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so people would, you know, put in for you, if they already had it and give you a package that way when you got in, you already had a little bit of what you would need in your cell, the toothbrush, the soap, et cetera, mm -hmm. just to take care of your very basic needs, right? Sure. Um, so they also offered political education classes. Um, they were offering um, self-defense networks and things of that nature. So people were getting trained and you had to learn about history and things of that nature. And, and the Battle Lagoon specifically talks about how they learned about you know, colonialism and, you know, mm -hmm. all these, he said all the isms, right? Um, yeah. So they learned about all these different things and it, and it was a, a sense of knowledge of self that they, that they received. And a lot of this was inspired by the, like the new African movement, um, mm -hmm. which is a kind of slept on, <clears throat> um, you know, form of identity or I don't say even identity, but it's, it was, it start, comes from the Republic of New Africa, which was this, idea of building your uh, uh, a, a sovereign state within the United States yeah. or a sovereign nation within the, the United States. Um, and there's that's a whole nother conversation, the different mm -hmm. journals and stuff that came from that. So they're reading a lot of that and that influences some of their ideology, even though there was some diversity as far as what people thought. So, you know, Lincoln Love was 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 just was part of that, um, you know, so they were always advocating for each other, too, I think. So Lincoln Love, as a jailhouse lawyers is advocating for um for other prisoners even mm -hmm. on this day um even even john balagoon cole like he was coming to be um a support for other prisoners at the time um I, I lay they call them lay advocates so mm -hmm. someone had to go to some kind of 
small trial within the prison. If they got in trouble, they would be a lay advocate who would vouch for the for the for who this person was and that they're, you know, doing their best to get to do their time and get out. Mm -hmm. So they were always supporting each other. So when this day occurs, it's not like out of nowhere. It's not like it, it's not it was spontaneous in the sense that it wasn't a planned thing. Like they didn't plan to take over the prison. But it was also understood that we we look out for each other. So we're not going to let somebody kill one of our brothers, you know, especially somebody who's helping get other people out of prison, you know, because that's yeah, what yeah. that's what Lincoln Love did. You know, mm -hmm. he, that's what jail lawyers do. They're reading through people's cases, reading through their, their files and telling them like they got this sure. wrong and this is what you should pursue. Because, you know, mm -hmm. most of these men have to deal with public defenders who even when they mean well are overwhelmed and yeah, sure. you know aren't aren't really able to to, to d dive deep into these cases mm -hmm. so so yeah that's that's um some sense of it but yeah they they always looked out for each other um that there was a tight bond so you're not going to just come in there and just beat them up and mm -hmm. think that they're going to just go for it every day like no you're not going to kill someone like that and and it's just and it just is accepted as it mm -hmm. often is on the outside it's just not it wasn't acceptable to them yeah and the emotion shown by some of the men who you interview who uh, have been released subsequently but who were there mm -hmm. at the time is so palpable you can see the the amount of love that they have for each other is really really comes off yeah so so the, the film shows and you've touched on this a little bit <clears> the film shows how the men collectively work to campaign for better conditions in the prison and I think a common belief is that when people are incarcerated, they effectively sign their rights away and they're seen as losing their right to protest. So mm -hmm. as somebody who makes media um, and is an author and a poet and so forth, um, and you're also an educator, at least to me, how do you think it might be possible to change this, this general belief? I mean, I think first people just need to, like you, you mentioned in the question um, in film shows, um, you know, they... But particularly these documentary film, mm. like these documentaries and documentaries, air quotes, these like kind of reality TV yeah, yeah. prison shows, they they kind of exploit the day-to-day -day nature of it. Or, you know, they follow like three people's storyline and they make it very individualistic. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't really get a good sense of the day-to-day -day other than these, these are really sensationalized stories, you know. That's right. Um, but... I mean, on a very simple level, it's just, to, it's just to understand that people are doing time like they're there every day. Like this isn't a place that you go for like for a weekend, you know, <laughs> like you are literally there every day. Right. So in to, to, to survive, you have to form bonds with other people, whether you like the kinds of bonds people form is not for me to judge, but you have to form bonds with other people to just mm -hmm. make it through. And I know that from having family that's been locked up, people will always say, well, you know, they're thinking like they're in prison. It's like, well, they were there every day. So even if they didn't spend yeah. as much time as some, some of these gentlemen, even if they were there for a few years, it's still every day. Any mm -hmm. of us who have to be somewhere every day are going to adapt to that environment. That's just, so it's no different in prison. Like it's not some kind of magical thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, you have to spend five years somewhere. You're going to adapt to that place if you're there all the time. And this is even worse because at least if you're at a job for five years, you get to leave. You know, sure. you get to travel. You can go on vacation. They don't get or to just do go any home of that. in the evening. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. They, they don't get to do none of that. Like, so there is no even changing of the environment other than maybe different parts of the prison. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I was talking to um one of their, I, I was trying to actually get in contact with them but I, they weren't available at the time and they would joke with me like well he's probably going to be watching the laker game you know because that and that's a big deal to even have mm -hmm. the privileges to watch a basketball game you mm -hmm. know inside there for us maybe we watch the game maybe we don't it's not that it could be a big thing for us because we have other things that we could be doing mm -hmm. you know they often get very little privileges so those kinds of things matter mm -hmm. you know so it's just like you can't um you know, you, you have to, you have to respect, like, you have to respect the, there's just the day-to-day -day humanity that anyone has to deal with. So it's like, yes, we need to understand like the, the organizing and all of those things are important, but I'm just saying on a real simple level, I don't no one, none of us are going to survive anywhere. If we don't form some kind of bonds, we're going to literally just 
you know, because human beings need social contact. Like that's mm. that's why solitary confinement and things like that are ridiculous because it's an inhumane because you need to meet and see other people. You need friends, you need family, you need community, right? So and people that's why feel, they're used. It's a form of torture, obviously, to break people right, down. Mm. Right. But people form communities. So they form community in a way that wasn't just we're just going to just do our time. No, we're going to look out for each other, right? We're going to educate each other. We're going to make mm. sure that people are fed. We're going to make sure people, when they go home, are we're going to rehabilitate each other, essentially. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're not going to ask them to do it. We're going to rehabilitate each other. Mm. So when we go home, we are more positive for our communities when we go home than we were when we entered in. Like that's when you talk to some of them who were involved in these things, that's how they, that's how they saw it. And they made a lot of sacrifices, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes not even fighting their own cases is so they could help someone else with their case, you know, like that, that's the, that's the stand that they took. So, um, cause it's like, you have all this time. It's like, what are we going to do with it? And through their reading and through their understanding, they felt like th this needed to be more than just, passing time you know we need to actually like help each other and look out yeah that comes across so strongly and i think you know this is so interesting when people think about the prison's role so supposedly in rehabilitating supposed mm. offenders and what you've said there is that they are involved in rehabilitating each other because obviously the prison's role is not is not to do that despite no, what is said on not, its face yeah right <laughs> Absolutely. So, so the film also talks about the role of the violent white supremacist um, group, the Sons of Light, which was active among the prison guards. So mm -hmm. how do you think we can connect the appearance of basically fascism among police and prison guards more generally, which we obviously know is common, it's common here as well as in the US and elsewhere, and the overall carceral system itself, which might not be openly white supremacist, but which is still obviously integral to maintaining and reproducing state racism. Right. I was, um, before we got on here, so I'm looking down, I was uh, reading um, a little bit of uh, Black Shirts and Reds. Um, uh, I think it's Michael Parenti's book on mm -hmm. Black Shirts and Reds. It's about fascism, uh, particularly, you know, during the time of Mussolini and Hitler. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was, was, was Nothing. I'm sorry. Uh, Go ahead. But there was there was something he said. Um, then and now, fascism has made irrational mass appeals in order to secure the rational ends of class domination. Mm. And that was just an introduction to one of the chapters. I was just skimming through it a little bit. But I think with prisons, we can get to the violence and all of that and the clan group. But prisons, if you're thinking about it in relation to fascism, are saying that we can resolve a problem of so-called crime, right? And this is where we can lock people up and get them out of your way. And then at the same time, we can provide jobs for people in those in those usual usually are in rural communities and are not very diverse. You're usually talking about a bunch of black prisoners, black and brown prisoners, and poor whites yeah. from the city who are then sent to these prisons. <clears throat> where you know it's rural it's rural whites who are often poor or don't have much and and that's obviously going to be a clash but on the broader scale they're telling society that this is a solution to the problem we can get rid of these people who are causing problems and you know who are threats to to the nation and stuff mm -hmm. like that that has a that it has a very fascist bent to it anyway because it's like fascism will tell you it's going to resolve a problem that it's not actually seeking to resolve for sure uh, but it yeah. but it always presents a very easy solution so yeah let's put people in cages and let's expect them to come out better you know it doesn't even make sense <laughs> but mm. but like that's the but that's the option and, and obviously the people that we're putting in cages are black people you know black men you know particularly those are the people we're putting in cages so of mm. course you know that's a that that's going to resolve the problem you know, that the rest of society doesn't have to deal with them anymore because we can just lock them away in some far away, you know, rural town or something of that nature. Um, but then that is also something that folks, again, with fascism gases up the whole nation, right? It doesn't just gas up the elite or it wouldn't work. So it gases up everyone who is part of that project and it gases up, you know, the white working rural class and gas, you know, so they go into these prisons Mm -hmm. And this is a form of initiation 
for them yeah. into the the kind of like fascist orders that we're talking about. We're talking about mm-hmm. white supremacist groups or anything of that nature. So they go into prisons, and yeah, they're gonna form white supremacist gangs. The prisoners and the prison and the prison guards are gonna form those gangs. It's it's a it's it's like a badge of honor for many of them, right? So mm-hmm. we don't know specifically the full origin stories of the Sons of Light because we only know about them because of a deposition given by one of the guards who worked there, who was even involved in this uprising, Michael Mm. Richardson. Um, But it's fair to assume that, you know, based on even what he said, this was a group that took pride in this. You know, Mm. they, they, they shared their literature around the prison, right? Mm. They, the, he talks about how the children played with the clan ropes, um, you know, of the, of the prisoners. And this wasn't just the low level guards. This went all throughout the ranks of the prison. Uh, so they see themselves in my in my opinion i can't say this is a fact but in my opinion like you know they see themselves as as the enforcers of fascism in that sense like they see themselves as like this is ground zero this is the very right. disposable people that we need to contain right like that because we're in the prison and prisons mm. show you the class stratification the particularly the racial stratification of society in very explicit ways because you can't really straddle lines as much inside prisons as you can on the outside. You can't really have it both ways in mm-hmm. the same way that you might be able to if you're petty bourgeois or something. That that doesn't really exist in prisons. There are still stratifications depending on what kinds of jobs people get in prison sometimes mm-hmm. or who's giving, like, I guess, order over a certain area. Some t- some, so there's a hierarchy of prison. It's not all flat, but it's, but it's different than how we understand it out here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but they're the enforcers of that. Them is the guards, them is the state. You know, they're the enforcers yeah. of that. And I think that comes from a broader sense, like we are the ones controlling the criminals, like we're doing a good thing. So I don't think if you were to actually get any of these sons of light people in front of you, that they would think they did anything wrong. I For genuinely sure. don't think they would, they would they would think that they're actually maintaining order, you know, or in some in some ways, I think this was, you know, this has been said about some of these more, the newer waves of white supremacy, they think that they are the state because they think the state has failed them, you know, so yeah. they think they need to do these things, you know? So mm. I think when we think about it in regards to fascism, I had to think about how fascism always presents oversimplified solutions that people think will resolve problems and, and a certain faction of people. And they always have a scapegoat of folks, right. To, to, to gas other people up. So you have white people who are gassed up by, people at the border or prisoners or whatever mm-hmm. crime and crime has always been one of the essential things to to use to gas people up is the fear of crime and this yeah this kind of this almost beast that is lurking behind the scenes that we all need to put down like that's a a common you know tenet of fascism and even liberalism honestly absolutely and i think you know what's interesting in that is that of course the state underwrites all of this Mm-hmm. So, you know, in in the name of kind of, again, like the, the idea, the liberal idea of reform, but ultimately the state is underwriting the practices yep. of fascism, which itself is, you know, imbricated in, like you can't disentangle the two, despite the fact that, you know, today, and maybe this is why an organization or whatever you want to call them, the group, the Sons of Light would see them as having to do the state's job for it because it's not doing it properly, is because of, you know, things like diversity. So, for example, mm-hmm. this idea that, you know, if we diversify the ranks of the prison guards and police, then somehow, you know, racism is going to, you know, slip away, which obviously we see isn't the case at all. And in fact, might lead to its intensification under the guise of, you know, diversity, which is something that you've written about on really, really well yeah. in other contexts. Yeah. Okay, so another thing um, I might want to ask you, and you've touched on this a little bit, but maybe another few words on it. So the importance of of maintaining one's own humanity and refusing to be uh, who they want us to be, which which is something that one of the men says at one point, is a really strong message in the film. So can you talk a little bit about this as a motivating force? Yeah, it was um, Naeem, uh, Mm. Christopher Naeem Trotter that said that... um, about how he wanted to maintain himself. And they both said it in their own own way that no matter what you do to me, I'm not, you're not going to turn me into the monster you keep telling me and telling everybody else that I am like, you're Mm -hmm. not going to, I'm not going to let you do it. You can, you can do a lot of things, but that's the one thing you can't break. You can't get to that. Right. So there's something 
you know, not to get like super spiritual here, you know, but I'm just saying there's something there for them, though. There's something they're saying that is inside, that is internal. Um, I think Naeem even referred to it as the inner God in him yes. or in, in people overall. Like, again, for them, that's something that is that is sacred, that no matter what the state does, you're not getting to it. And, and when you talk to them, even beyond what, how you hear them in the film, you know, they're always like, you know, I'm not saying that, that everything is okay because they went through a lot more than most people. But, you know, you can tell that that part is always intact. I'm sure they struggle and wrestle with it. But that part of them that they know they did the right thing that, and, yeah. and they always say that. And, and you know, Naeem has told me directly, like, if I, I'm, I'm at peace with whatever happens, I know I did what I was supposed to do. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm I'm good with that. And and there's a resolve there that I think can give all of us strength, you know, because so easy out here to be compromised. And when you mm. see they could have they could have gotten out probably if they had compromised, they probably could have snitched on somebody or, you know, I don't know, you know, they could have done many things that could have gotten them out, but they mm. didn't want to do that. You know, I mean, and they could have just went home. You know, remember, Naeem only had three months and Balagun only had three and a half years. Yeah. They could have just went home and let this happen. But they they felt like them and, and others as well felt like, no, we can't we can't let that go down. And mm -hmm. again, I think that's that's something that should be studied, you know, because it's, it's not really, you know, out here, it's tough to get people to feel that convicted about anything. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, honestly, like, it's just, it's tough to get people to feel that convicted, but they, for them, that's something that you're not going to take. And and with Balagoon, you know, he, he talks about finding strength, not just internally, but even in the strength of seeing how others dealt with these situations. He talks about Bobby Sands in Ireland, oh, yeah. you know, he talks mm -hmm. about Mamiya Abu Jamal. Um, he talks about the struggle uh, against, against prisons in Canada and et cetera. And he's, and and he's reading all this stuff around the world to give him strength mm -hmm. while he's in a hunger strike or while he's going mm -hmm. through whatever they're putting him through. So it's also not just this internal thing that's separate of everyone else, but finding that how their humanity connects to these broader struggles around the world against these this kind of, you know, repression. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, to counter the individualism that we're, we're taught today, I mean, I think mm. even, you know, young people are taught, you know, to get ahead, you have to think of yourself or even things like, you know, misunderstandings of self care and what that means. And you know, oh, there's, there's so much emphasis, yeah. <laughs> there's so much yeah. emphasis on, you know, <laughs> ourselves beyond anybody else. Mm. Um, and it, this is, yeah, it's incredibly inspiring. And I'm sure that everybody who watches it will be inspired. I certainly was, I think I had a few tears in my eyes towards the end, because it was just so that message was just so strong. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so so finally, what is any message that you might have for people outside the US who might be learning about this case for the first time? For example, as you know, I'm sure indigenous people in Australia are among the most incarcerated people in the world. And, you know, talking of people rising up in prison just just now, just in the last few days, there was an uprising of young people who were who are incarcerated in um, Western Australia. So these are teens. And, you know, just the rhetoric about them in the press is kind of violent or even terrorist. And these are, you know, young kids is mm -hmm. is absolutely incredible. But, you know, they're anyway, how do you think it might be possible to make ties of solidarity between movements like and the campaign that you're involved in and, and others that you might be aware of elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, we haven't really talked a lot about it in this conversation, but when we talk about political prisoners, um, you know, I always say that's not just a, a label or something. It's the, it, the point of it is to say, um, from the perspective of the state, it's that these individuals or this group, whomever is targeted, are we're going to punish them beyond whatever crime they may have committed or a crime that they didn't commit at all. <laughs> Uh, we're going to punish them beyond just the simple, oh, you stole something you need to pay for it, whatever, mm -hmm. even if you don't, you know, regardless of how we feel about that. No, we're going to we're going to give them the steepest penalty possible to make an example of them to the rest of the population. So they never think that they can get away with mm -hmm. what these people just did. Right. And that so you so when you think about it, in that sense, that's that's very broad. And there's a lot of intersections and a lot of ways that we can connect our struggles, because no matter what we're talking about, whether we're talking about, you know, um, 
you know, it's even someone like Martin Luther King would at, at the time would have been a political prisoner because he got arrested at protest. Nelson Mandela was a political prisoner, you know, for 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 a very long time. You mm -hmm. know, um, you know, um, Angela Davis was a political prisoner. I'm just naming like more internationally known figures like these are people who were locked up, um, whether they got out or not, you know, where they were locked up. <clears throat> Because the the point was to make an example of them to the rest of the world, mm -hmm. you know. It's so so. In, whether we're talking about the struggles in Australia, whether we're talking about the struggles here, you know, when people rise up and do things that might go outside the lines that the state designed for you to do, and then they come and persecute them. If you're not if you're not one of those people who were out there initially, the very least you can do, excuse me, is have is have the back of those people. Yeah, because otherwise the line is just going to get pushed further back. <laughs> That's how it works. So if they're allowed to just send people to prison, like in, in the case of Pendleton's who for 200 plus years are trying to save a man's life. And in case where no one even died and that's just OK, mm -hmm. then the line just gets pushed back. And the next the next wave of things won't even be as radical as they used to be, because people are more are probably even more scared. I heard there's not going to be as many people involved the next time or something of that nature because if you allow this to happen then you know it's gonna it's gonna create a a, a, a chilling effect on mm -hmm. on everyone else and when you're dealing with when you're fighting against the state when you're fighting against capital when you're fighting against white supremacy you need as many hands on deck as you can get and you need yeah. as many people that feel emboldened to do what is ever necessary mm -hmm. to get free the less and less you have that the harder it's going to be to resolve your problems so mm -hmm. when you when 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 they push when they when they beat up on us you know we have to have each other's back like they they had each other's back you know they understood that they weren't going to let anybody um just beat up on someone nearly to death and that was just going to be that nah mm -hmm. like if they had anything to say about it you know they were going to intervene and then you know if we're thinking about anything whether it's the george floyd with all the stuff we see where people get yeah. killed on camera not just here in the u.s whether it's palestine wherever we're at yeah. you know emboldening people's ability to intervene in that knowing that whatever is happening is already wrong is the least we all can do even if i'm not saying everybody has to pick up a gun or do anything that's quote-unquote illegal i'm not just for, for the record i'm not suggesting that <laughs> but i'm saying that even if it is just what we're doing we're not doing anything illegal and talking about our campaign we're simply just trying to help them get out of prison, you yeah. know. Like that's that's all. We're, that's we're not doing anything that's going to send us to prison unless somebody again makes up stuff. <laughs> we're not, you know, we're not crossing any lines. But the least you can do is that, you know, because the again when those examples are made and the the message the state is trying to send, you have to push back on that message, mm -hmm. or they win. And and if we're trying to win, we we can't tolerate that. Yeah, I think that's a really good place to end. I could ask you a million more questions, but I think we'll we'll draw it to a close. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. And um, let's free the Pendleton too. Definitely. Thank you.